One thing is for certain, ladies and gents. America has no shortage of serial killers. In the annals of American crime history, one name stands out with chilling notoriety, though. Known as America's first serial killer, Herman Webster Mudgett, later known as H. H. Holmes, was one of the most horrific serial killers the world came to witness. So horrendous, in fact, that he, or rather his creation, became the inspiration behind the murderous Hotel Cortez of the fifth season in the anthology television series American Horror Story. Let us now delve into the origins of this individual and what made him become one of the most prolific serial killers in the American crime history book. Herman Webster Mudgett was born on May 16, 1861, in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Little is known about his early life, but he reportedly had a difficult childhood and was often bullied. Despite his troubled upbringing, he displayed intelligence from a young age and developed a fascination with medicine and anatomy. It is believed that he allegedly would trap animals and perform surgeries on them. Some accounts of his life even suggest that he killed a childhood friend. Holmes attended the University of Michigan's medical school in Ann Arbor, where he studied medicine. While enrolled in medical school, Holmes started his criminal offenses by stealing cadavers from the laboratory, burning or disfiguring them, and then planting the bodies to make it look as if they had been killed in an accident. And if you think that's vile, he would also take out insurance policies on these people before planting the bodies and would collect money once the bodies were discovered. In 1884, Holmes passed his medical exams and returned home, where he would start his career as a fraudster and a conman. His first scam took place during a smallpox outbreak. Mudgett would pose as a government official in order to sell vaccines. The money he made he spent to open a laboratory where he could create a patent medicine, which was fortunately never developed. In 1885, he moved to Chicago where he got a job working at a pharmacy located near Jackson Park, under the alias Dr. Henry H. Holmes. When the owner of the drugstore passed away, Expectedly, he left his wife to take over the responsibilities of the store. However, Holmes convinced the widow to let him buy the store. As you probably guessed, the widow soon went missing and was never seen again. Holmes claimed that she moved to California, but this could never be verified. After Holmes had become the owner of the drugstore, he purchased an empty lot across the street. In the years leading up to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, he designed and constructed a three-story building that would later become infamously known as the Murder Castle. During its 1889 construction, Holmes hired and fired multiple construction crews so that no one would have a clear idea of what he was masterminding. The building was strategically located close to the fairgrounds, and Holmes intended to use it to capitalize on the influx of tourists and visitors. After construction was complete in 1891, Holmes placed ads in newspapers offering jobs for young women and advertised the castle as a place of lodging. He also placed ads presenting himself as a wealthy man looking for a wife. All of Holmes' employees, hotel guests, fiancés and wives were required to have life insurance policies. Holmes paid the premiums as long as they listed him as the beneficiary. Most of his fiancés and wives would suddenly disappear, as did many of his employees and guests. People in the neighborhood eventually reported that they saw many women enter the castle, but would never see them exit. In 1893, Chicago was given the honor of hosting the World's Fair, a cultural and social event to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. The event was scheduled from May to October and attracted millions of people from all over the world. Holmes surely saw this as a tremendous opportunity because he must have predicted many visitors would be searching for lodging near the fair and believed many of them would be women whom he could easily seduce into staying at this hotel. After being lured into his hotel, many of these out-of-town visitors would never be seen again. The murder castle and what it entailed within were truly the stuff of nightmares. The first floor of the castle had several stores. The two upper levels contained Holmes's office and over 100 rooms that were used as living quarters. Almost all rooms were soundproofed, 
and contained gas lines so that Holmes could asphyxiate his guests whenever he felt like it. Throughout the building there were trapdoors, peepholes, stairways that led nowhere, and chutes that led into the basement. The basement was designed as Holmes' own lab. It had a dissecting table, stretching rack, and crematory. Sometimes he would send the bodies down the chute, dissect them, strip them of the flesh, and sell them as human skeleton models to medical schools. In other cases, he would choose to cremate or place the bodies into pits of acid. Holmes's modus operandi involved luring vulnerable and unsuspecting victims, mainly young women and travelers, into his hotel. He charmed them with his charisma and manipulated their trust. Once inside the murder castle, he subjected his victims to unspeakable horrors, including torture, sexual assault, and murder. Not much is known about the people that disappeared during the World's Fair, given that the third story of the building was burned as a result of a major insurance fraud scheme that apparently didn't go very well. During this period, Holmes found himself on the run, traveling throughout the US, committing insurance scams with his accomplice, Benjamin Pitzel. Once the World's Fair had ended, Chicago's economy was in a slump. Therefore, Holmes basically abandoned the castle and focused on insurance fraud, committing random murders along the way. While on the road, he would steal horses from Texas, ship them to St. Louis, and sell them, thus making a fortune. He was arrested for this swindle and sent to jail. While in jail, he concocted a new insurance scam with his cellmate, Marion Hedgepeth. Holmes claimed he would take out an insurance policy for $10,000, fake his own death, and then provide Hedgepeth with $500 in exchange for a lawyer who could help him if any problems arose. Once Holmes was released from jail on bail, he attempted his plan. However, the insurance company was suspicious and did not pay him. Holmes then decided to attempt a similar plan in Philadelphia. This time, he would have Pitzel fake his own death. However, during this scam, Holmes actually killed him and collected the money for himself. He then convinced Pitzel's widow, who had been aware of her husband's involvement in the insurance scheme, that her husband was still alive, later giving her $500 of the money he collected. Worried that some of Pitzel's five children might alert the authorities, Holmes killed two of his daughters, Alice and Nellie, and his little son Howard. In 1894, Marion Hedgepath, who was angry that he did not receive any money in the initial scam, told police about the scam Holmes had planned. The police tracked Holmes, finally catching up to him in Boston, where they arrested him and held him on an outstanding warrant for the Texas horse swindle. At the time of his arrest, Holmes appeared as if he was prepared to flee the country, and police grew even more suspicious of him. Chicago police then investigated Holmes' hotel, where they discovered his abhorrent and cruel methods for committing his crimes. Many of the bodies they located were so badly dismembered and decomposed that it was hard for the police to determine exactly how many bodies there really were. The police investigation spread throughout Chicago, Indianapolis, and Toronto. While conducting their investigation in Toronto, police discovered the burned bodies in a cellar of the Pitzel's children, who had gone missing sometime during Holmes' insurance fraud spree. He was tried in Philadelphia for the murder of Pitzel and was sentenced to death by hanging. His trial became a media sensation, and his audacious personality kept him in the spotlight. Holmes really did enjoy the media frenzy and the headlines about him and his so-called murder castle. While awaiting his punishment, he was even asked to write an autobiography of his crimes. In this book, he confessed to 27 murders, keeping in mind he later increased the total to more than 130, though some researchers have suggested that the real number exceeded 200. Herman Webster Mudgett was executed by hanging on May 7, 1896, at the Moya Mansing prison in Philadelphia. As for the exact number of Holmes's victims, it still remains a subject of debate and speculation. Like I mentioned, estimates even exceed 200. Some believe that Holmes may have exaggerated the number of his victims to capitalize on his notoriety and gain public attention. Due to his cunning nature and meticulous efforts to dispose of the bodies within the castle, it is challenging to establish a precise count of his crimes. 
Holmes's Castle of Horror was eventually demolished completely in 1938, or what remained of it anyway, since the fire started by an unknown arsonist shortly after Holmes's arrest. The ground that hosted once a terrifying castle of violence and crime now shelters the post office headquarters, namely the Inglewood branch of the US post office. As the story of H. H. Holmes draws to a close, we are left with a profound sense of dread and, dare I say, fascination. His life was a dark tapestry woven with deception, charm and unspeakable violence, making him a haunting figure in American but also world history. The Murder Castle, a grim monument to his malevolence, stands as a chilling testament to his calculated and horrifying crimes. The legacy of H. H. Holmes continues to captivate and terrify us, reminding us of the potential evil lurking within the most seemingly charming individuals. His story serves as a chilling cautionary tale, urging us women, first and foremost, and I suppose men, to remain vigilant against the darkness that can exist inside even the most unsuspicious of persons. His dark tale will forever be etched into history, serving as a stark reminder of the human capacity for both cruelty and fascination with the macabre. The shadow cast by H. H. Holmes will forever linger, a haunting specter of humanity's darkest impulses. Thank you for watching.